Good morning, good afternoon uh, to um, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Kamel Senoussi from the University of Geneva, the ADVAC team. Um, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you all to this um, joint uh, webinar between uh, ADVAC, the, the course, and um, the IABS, the International Alliance for uh, Biological Standardization. Um, this session uh, will be uh, co-chaired uh, between uh, um, Joris van der Put from the IABS and myself. Um, before introducing uh, my co-chair, I would like just to remind the participants that this session will be registered and we will share the link to this session right after um, the session. Uh, we also, I also wanted to, um, to um, give a short summary of the way we're going we're gonna to proceed. We're going to have a short introduction from uh, Joris, my co-chair. Uh, then we're going to have two presentations from speakers that will be introduced by, uh, by Yoris uh, on the monkeypox, human and animals. Then we'll have a panel discussion that uh, I'll uh, animate again with Yoris. And um, we're going to have the speakers and an additional participant during those, uh, this panel discussion. And then we will open uh, for questions from the participants. So please, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Um, and um, during this last uh, section of this webinar, we will uh, ask you to uh, ask your question directly using uh, the mic and the, the camera uh, to make it more interactive. And uh, if you don't want to do that, just mention it in the, in the chat and I will uh, then ask the question uh, to the participants. Um, I think I said it all. So let me introduce uh, Joris uh, van der Put. Uh, who's the co-chair. So Yoris uh, is a doctor in uh, veterinary medicines, uh, has more than 40 years experience in human and animal diseases, uh, as a virologist on animal diseases and flu, uh, particularly in zoonotic aspects. He, he was the global head of vaccine development for swine and ruminants at the Rhône Merieu, uh, later called Merial. He then worked at Gavi more in the human side of vaccines, uh, at the early days of Gavi, 20, uh, 21 and 2005. Then after that, he continued as a consultant in human and animal um, contagious disease control. He worked on the plan to eliminate rabies by 2030. He worked on tuberculosis vaccine development, and he's now more involved in uh, platform technology development uh, for uh, health threats and pandemics. He supported, uh, of course, as many of us, the COVID-19 initiatives, and he worked on the correlates of protection and worked also with the World Health Organization for Animal Health um, on the strengthening of animal health services in low and middle income countries, especially on the early warning system. So as you see, he's a perfect co-chair for this discussion around uh, e-health, animal and human health. And uh, lastly, he was the president of the IABS, and he's also a lecturer. Oh, uh, at the at the AVRAC course. So let me hand over to uh, to you, Joris. Uh, please, Joris, go ahead. Thank you very much, Kamel, for these kind words. And uh, thanks um, before all to ADVAC to organize this uh, very interesting meeting, which really comes timely um, when we see what happens during the recent months, the recent year on monkeypox, which is a very good example of spillover of uh, a virus and like many viruses can do from animals to humans. So um, uh, we will see how this uh, virus um, spilled over to uh, humans from animals and also in the second presentation, how it can in fact also spill over from humans to animals. I like to remind that um, more than about 60, uh, 60 to 70 percent of new infectious diseases in humans have an animal origin. Only in less than the last decade we have seen uh, Nipah, Zika, SARS-CoV-1, MERS, SARS-CoV-2, uh, only to, to mention some of the very important diseases. And um, we can be almost sure that this will continue. 
it's of course always very difficult to say when, but that it will happen. We see it almost, I would say, every day and um, actuality reminds us. In the frame of this webinar, I would like to recommend to read a paper that was published by Aaron Bernstein in February of this year, together with his colleagues. And the title of the paper is The Cost and Benefits of Primary Prevention of Zoonotic Pandemics. This paper stresses the urgent need for more anticipation, meaning more research on viral discovery, on surveillance, and on more intensive collaboration between the human and the animal side, between the human and the animal health services, in order to anticipate better in a global perspective and to establish better um, pandemic preparation. It's also very important to be more active in this anticip and anticipation research in order to evaluate the, threats, the threats and the risks. And as we have seen with COVID, we were very happy that uh, not only platform technologies were there, but there was already a lot of basic science on coronaviruses like MERS, like uh, the SARS-CoV-1 and other coronaviruses. But this has to be deepened. Today, with the monkeypox experience as an example, we will try to reflect better and more in depth how we can do better in the frame of One Health. So to introduce to uh, our discussions and our uh, presentations, I will introduce now our three highly um, um, highly experienced uh, presenters. First, I will present Dr. Jean-Marie Okwobele, whom you will see active in the panel discussion. Dr. Okwobele has worked for more than 40 years in the support of immunization and, um, and anti-emergency disease control in his own country, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and on an international level. He was the director of the WHO Vaccines and Immunization Program in Geneva from 2004 to 2017, till he retired. He now provides advisory board and consulting services to many organizations. He served as a member of the WHO Review Committee on functioning of the international health regulations during the COVID-19 response, and he is currently the chair of the WHO Emergency Committee on Multi-Country Outbreak of Monkeypox. Our second speaker will be Dr. Brett Peterson. Dr. Brett Peterson is a captain in the United States Public Health Service and currently serves as Deputy Branch Chief of the CDC's pox virus and rabies branch. Dr. Peterson led the development of national recommendations for the use of smallpox vaccine for the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice um, in the smallpox vaccine working group. He was involved in the COVID-19 response, served as deputy incident manager for CDC's response to Zika in 2016 to 2017, and was deployed to Liberia to assist with the Ebola response in 2014. More recently, he led the clinical task force of CDC's response to monkeypox outbreak. Prior to joining CDC, Dr. Peterson received his Bachelor's of Science from the University of California, San Diego, his Master's of Public Health from Johns Hopkins University, and his medical degree from the University of Michigan. He completed his medical training at the University of California, San Diego Medical Center, and is board certified in internal medicine. Our first speaker will be Dr. Yoshi Nakazawa. 
Dr. Yoshi Nakazawa is the lead of the evolutionary analysis and ecology team of the pox virus and rabies branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He holds a Bachelor in Science in Biology and a PhD in Geography, and his research interests focus on the study of ecologic, biogeographic, and evolutionary aspects of orthopox viruses. These studies include field and laboratory investigations into the potential reservoirs of orthopox viruses, such as monkeypox, acmetavirus, and Alaska pox. He has participated in multiple outbreak responses during, uh, including the 2022 monkeypox uh, multinational response, where he served as a co-lead of the modeling team. So Yoshi, you are the first speaker. The floor is yours now and you have 20 minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me find the share button here. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation and thank you very much for um, inviting me to present here today. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm gonna try to give you a little um, bit of background and general characteristics of um, monkeypox and um, and the epidemiology and what we know uh, and some of the uh, uh, work that we have done in animals um, regarding monkeypox or mpox and this and, and apologize for uh, having monkeypox and mpox because we're still in the middle of changing uh, the name so I have not a uh, complete transition to that so mpox uh, now that we're talking about so uh, monkeypox virus is a, a pox uh, is a member of the pox viridae family. Uh, which uh, has um, large, uh, complex, uh, double-standard DNA viruses uh, that, in, that um, have uh, uh, genomes, uh, large genomes of more than 200,000 uh, base pairs and can encode for more than 200 proteins. Uh, other uh, notable members of this um, this family and especially part of these the same um, genus uh, are uh, variola virus, which is uh, the causative agent of smallpox, and vaccinia virus, which is a virus that was used and continues to be used in vaccines to to prevent uh, to to vaccinate against smallpox and now against uh, monkeypox or mpox. Um, uh, monkeypox or mpox is a zoonotic disease and uh, its clinical presentation closely resembles that of uh, smallpox. Uh, patients uh, are ill for two to four weeks and the mortality uh, is much lower than smallpox between one and 11 percent in, in individuals with no history of vaccination against smallpox. The virus was first described in wild-caught laboratory monkeys in uh, Denmark, um, hence the, the name, uh, monkeypox. Uh, and then the first human case was um, first reported in, was, was reported in DRC in 1970s, um, in the 19, in 1970. Currently, there are two clades of the virus uh, recognized. Uh, one is, uh, clade one is, in Congo Basin and in, clay, in the Congo Basin, formerly Congo Basin is in Central Africa, and clay two is, is associated with countries in, in West Africa. These two clays have uh, differences in pathogenicity and, and clinical presentation, and also gen, uh, genetical, uh, genetic differences. Um, this is just a map to show uh, the, the geographic distribution of these two clades. In purple, you see clay two in all West African countries, uh, which is uh, the clade in which uh, to which the current outbreak uh, it is uh, associated with, uh, the strengths of the current outbreak uh, associated with, and then clade one uh, in Central Africa from Cameroon to to the east into uh, DRC and ROC and, and more recently in CAR. Uh, this case in South Sudan is, is more likely, it is, it's thought to have been imported from uh, DRC. So it's still, uh, these, all, all these cases are still associated mainly with the rainforest uh, of sub-Saharan African countries. Um, 
So transmission, uh, I'm going to go very quickly through this. Uh, hum, animal to human transmission is not transmission is, um, is continues to be a big, uh, a, a, a big part of the transmission in the in the endemic areas and contribute a high number of cases every year, especially in DRC and, and Central Africa Republic. Uh, human to human transmission uh, is has been known to occur in for plate one uh, of this virus, and um, but normally with short chains of transmission. Uh, the, the longest chain of transmission that has been recorded is seven generations uh, of transmission. Uh, and for clay two has not been known until very recently in, in, in the uh, Nigeria, in the outbreak in Nigeria in 2017. And, and since then, well now in the current outbreak is, is also part of this. Uh, transmission of uh, this virus normally uh, happens through close co contact is the main mode of transmission of this virus. And um, that's also true for the current outbreak. Uh, and it, um, it is associated with direct contact with uh, lesions or droplets or secretions of uh, infected humans or animals. Um, and that's how people get, get infected. Um, in the the last uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, there has been a uh, recorded increased incidence in uh, endemic countries such as the Democratic Republic of Congo, and then cases uh, in increased incidence also in um, other countries like CR uh, or Republic of the Congo, and then also um, in countries such as Sierra Leone, Liberia, Nigeria, and Cameroon, where the disease was reported in, in the 70s, and now uh, after 30 or 40 years, new cases have been reported um, it, uh, after no reporting cases in that for that long. Uh, causes of this uh, increase in reporting or, or re-emergence um, are numerous and, and in, include um, the waning of immunity or the absence of immunity of people now that the smallpox vaccine is not being uh, broadly um, distributed or applied to people. Um, the improvement of disease detection systems in different countries, especially after the outbreak of Ebola. Uh, so now we are able to capture uh, cases more uh, efficiently. Uh, or other factors that could be involved is the movement of people or uh, environmental or ecological changes in, um, in, in the animals or environments or climate change too. Um, uh, um, clinical features, historically, what we have uh, seen with monkeypox is, is or, uh, with monkeypox is a favorite prodrome uh, two to five days before the, the characteristic rash. Uh, this prodrome uh, includes fatigue, headache, respiratory symptoms, uh, and lymphadenopathy. Uh, the characteristic rash uh, is similar to that of smallpox and goes through all the stages of development from macular, papal, vesicle, postural, uh, cross, and desquamation. And the lesions are uh, deep seated, firm, uh, well circumscribed, and central umbilication. Uh, these are some of the some pictures showing um, the lesions uh, the, in, the, in the right hand side, uh, showing um, uh, uh, lesions in the palm of the hands, and also, uh, which is very characteristic of monkeypox, and also they can show in, in soles of, of the feet. So these are very well circumscribed with that dips uh, central uh, central umbilication, um, very characteristic lesions of, lesions of um, monkeypox. Um, there are also um, additional complications of sequelae. One that is picture, uh, shown here in the pictures is uh, potential ocular, ocular infections that could come, uh, conduce to uh, coronal scarring and then have some uh, long-term visual uh, problems uh, for the patients. Uh, but there are many others, and I think uh, Brett is going to cover some of these too. Um, this is a map showing uh, the distribution, the historic distribution of uh, Mpox in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the years are showing the last human case reported in each of the countries before the current outbreak. And then, and there are two 
two uh, um, countries in which animals uh, have been reported, for example, uh, Cameroon, we have uh, chimpanzees that were uh, or two outbreaks in, chim in captive chimpanzees uh, um, in 2014 and 2016 um, of mpox. And then in Ivory Coast, uh, one monkey, a surimanga bee, that was found a seed in the forest and from which um, um, an isolate was being able to be recovered in, in 2012. Um, besides that uh, not much is known about uh, animal disease, and we'll continue to cover that in the next slides. Um, this is a timeline um, for um, for mpox uh, since the begin since the start uh, uh, the first description in nineteen fifty. Eight, uh, in Copenhagen, in laboratory animals that was followed with a, uh, by a few other uh, outbreaks in other captive monkeys, and then in twenty in nineteen seventy the first human case uh, in in DRC was reported, uh, followed by a few other uh, a few other cases uh, in in or several, several cases in a few other countries in Central and West Africa. Mainly, uh, or mainly captured through uh, the active surveillance uh, associated with the uh, smallpox eradication program. Uh, since these descriptions, well, there's, there was also, of course, interest in uh, understanding the disease and, and understanding how it is maintained in in nature. So uh, there were several uh, expeditions and some uh, studies trying to identify the animal reservoir of, uh, of uh, monkeypox virus, uh, looking at many different animals, which uh, including monkeys, which seem to be more as uh, accidental host than uh, a reservoir host uh, maintaining the virus in, in, in nature. Uh, and and rodents, uh, squirrels were uh, especially, particularly squirrels were um, found to be more uh, uh, like have more uh, evidence that they, they could be potential reservoirs for this for these uh, virus, uh, especially in studies in DRC and other places. <clears throat> After that. Um, Animal studies or uh, ecological investigations uh, were not conducted until uh, after the 2003 um, uh, um, outbreak in the U.S. Uh, that that involved some uh, animal some animals uh, imported from Ghana, uh, which were the source of of the of the of, of the outbreak, and then. <clears throat> Most of the cases, human cases in the 90s and to early 2000s uh, uh, come from Central, Central Africa until uh, 2017 where the, um, the uh, outbreak in Nigeria occurred. And then well, we have the 2020 and the 22 global outbreak that uh, Brady is going to um, talk about more. Um, so looking at host, uh, systems for orthopox viruses. Uh, so we have cowpox, which is in Eurasia, volpox in the United States, terapox, which is in, in West Africa, and then like metavirus in, in the Caucasus regions, and Alaska pox in Alaska. All these uh, potential hosts or animals that have been associated with transmission and maintenance of, of the virus, of these viruses in nature are small rodents, uh, mice of the genus Apodemus, or Premiscus, and, and um, voles from the genus Myodis and gerbils from, from the genus Datera. So that makes us think too that um, it seems it seems all these viruses are very closely related to uh, monkeypox virus, then uh, monkeypox virus could be also is is further evidence that, that uh, rodents may be involved in, in their in the in its circulations and maintain. So it's still uh, the actual species uh, that maintain the virus is, is, is unknown. There's a lot of things that we still need to, to know but and investigate. Uh, but um, as I said before, the Surimanga bee uh, is a monkey in Cote d'Ivoire was the first, was is one of the two isolates that have been recovered from a wild, uh, for a wild uh, animal. Uh, this is a, a clade two um, 
uh, isolate from uh, monkeypox, and then a rope squirrel doing those investigations in 19 in the 80s uh, uh, was found to be sick, and then an isolate from clade one was was recovered, and that's the only isolate that we have uh, recovered from an animal, uh, a wild animal in in an endemic area. Uh, uh, from the 2003 um, U.S. outbreak, uh, we know that some of the animals uh, that were involved, well, some, we know some of the animals that were involved, and then, uh, of course, there's the rope squirrel here, but then two other animals, um, two other species, which is a um, African dormice up here in the uh, upper corner, and then Chrysotomies, uh, well, Gambian rats, uh, Gambian uh, giant pouch rats. Um, here uh, in, in the right uh, that have also been uh, studied and, and since then they uh, so, uh, they, they, they have been proven to, to be susceptible to infection with, with the virus and then uh, we continue to acquire evidence on, on its potential their potential involvement in, in maintaining the virus in nature. So the uh, very briefly the US uh, Monkeypox outbreak or mpox outbreak in 2003 involved animals that were brought from from Ghana, uh, and they were um, stored or kept in uh, in cages in an animal facility, and then they were moved to other place. Uh, but then uh, prey dogs were involved, were co-housed or were I uh, put in the same cages. So that's uh, that's how the the prey dogs were. Uh, acquired the virus and were infected, and these these predators were then sold to uh, other people as pets. And then, when they they had contact, developed the, the disease and had contact with people, then the people acquired the disease, and that's basically what happened. And that's how we also uh, knew that uh, or learned that predators can be infected with monkeypox, and 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 since then they have been used in several uh, animal studies to to study different different uh, aspects of the transmission of monkeypox and some um, uh, medical countermeasures uh, too. So. Uh, this is a hypothetical uh, cycle of uh, monkeypox, and we see that uh, from what we know, there is a potential of many animals and many species of animals being um, involved in the transmission or maintenance of monkeypox virus in nature. And then there are some, uh, they, from them, they can infect some accidental host like monkeys, as we talked before. And then they, oh, humans can also be infected through uh, direct contact with uh, the presenting reservoirs uh, in, in the wild or in, in, in captive uh, circumstances, or um, they can also be uh, in contact with those spillover hosts or accidental hosts like monkeys uh, through hunting or, in, or when they're uh, in captivity, manipulating captivity. So uh, to understand more of uh, the ecology and, and how uh, the, the different species and animals are, are being involved. One of the things uh, that I mentioned that has been used is, is this uh, uh, huge ecological investigations in, which involve trapping animals uh, using many of these, these traps. Um, then uh, those animals are uh, brought into process uh, to processing uh, areas um, where they're examined for uh, for lesions or signs of the disease, and then also uh, samples are taken, such as blood and other types of, of samples. Uh, they're weighted and measured, and all of that. And those samples then are taken to to the lab, uh, which we use our, uh, our, our normal um, techniques, uh, laboratory techniques uh, like a PCR to to find. Um, uh, evidence of uh, DNA, viral DNA in those samples, or serology for um, for um, antibodies detection, detection of antibodies, which um, is is our, our, those are our main uh, main tools. Uh, this map shows um, the locations or our uh, efforts of uh, these types of investigations, um, uh, ecological surveys, uh, mainly, well, since the 2004 Ghana uh, investigation, and then more recently we have uh, um, 
focus in these endemic countries uh, such as DRC in, in Schwaba, we have a few uh, sites there. ROC, we investigated some, some cases, uh, an outbreak in 2017, and then Cameroon and Nigeria, where we continue uh, actively working with uh, local partners to, to, to do these uh, ecological investigations. And this, these are complemented, as I had said before, with animal studies and challenge studies to, to evaluate susceptibility of different animals. This is a, a pouch, um, pouch right and the, um, the rope squirrel, which are showing both that they can be susceptible and then have been shown that they can produce um, levels of virus um, that can be infectious, uh, uh, suggesting that it can transmit the virus to other animals uh, or to people. And then, uh, and then finally, we also are complementing all these uh, investigations into, into the animals with uh, more uh, focus uh, analysis or studies um, associated with the interaction with human, uh, um, humans and animals, such as value chain studies or, um, or, or more qualitative anthropological um, uh, uh, orient, anthropologically oriented uh, studies uh, to understand how people get infected with animals and how their interaction with wild animals uh, can contribute to this, this transmission of, of the disease. Two minutes. But, Okay, finally, yeah, this is uh, my two, last two slides. Finally, the, the, uh, uh, tying this back into the current uh, uh, current outbreak, uh, uh, the main the main way of transmission, the main mode of transmission uh, during this outbreak of Mpox has been uh, human to human. Thankfully, there has not been much of a uh, zoonotic or, or um, in zoonotic transmission in in the global uh, in the global area. Uh, so, but uh, the current messaging uh, continues to be. I mean, there's still continues to be uh, concern in terms of um, human people transmitting uh, the 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 virus into animals and potentially establishing other animals. So, the current messaging is is to avoid when people is is uh, infected to avoid any type of contact with with animals or as much as possible. Uh, although uh, there have been a couple of uh, instances in which um, people have shown um, at least PCR positives from dogs, uh, uh, kind of. Uh, suggesting that uh, these animals have been uh, well have been infected, or, can, or this virus can infect these animals. Uh, although the the evidence continues to be weak, and and, con and we continue to to look into into uh, um, confirming if this is actually an infection or not. But if uh, if it is an infection, it may mean that they are not as good. Um, uh, reservoir hosts uh, for this virus since uh, the, the viral load or the, the signal of PCR is very, very low, but this is definitely something that we, that the, we and other groups are um, continuing to, to investigate and, and get more, more information. So uh, with that, I think I, that's the end of it and I can uh, pass it on to Brett. Thank you very much. Yoshi, and you. Brett, the floor is yours. Okay, very good. I think I have my slides up, so hopefully everybody can see that. Um, That's okay. Great. All right. Well, hello, everybody, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's a great pleasure for me to join you all, particularly as an ad back alumni. Uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to uh, join this illustrious panel and, and speak with you all today. So my goal is to give a little bit more of an update on the human side of MPOX, uh, talking a little bit more about uh, the current outbreak and to go into a little bit de of detail on the use of vaccines uh, during the outbreak. So I think we've gotten a very good uh, overview and introduction to, uh, to MPOX from Yoshi. So I'll start with uh, the current situation with the global MPOX outbreak. 
Uh, there's been a total of 81,766 confirmed cases to date, and unfortunately, there have been 60 deaths reported. Um, 110 countries have reported cases, and you can see the epidemic curve here. First cases were identified in May, to, uh, May of this year. WHO de declared a public health emergency of international concern on July 23rd. And the cases peaked really in August and we were coming down in the number of cases, but unfortunately we are still seeing a number of cases. So persistent um, transmission of virus is still ongoing. In terms of the epidemiology that we've seen in this outbreak, uh, it's clearly been predominantly male with 96.8% of all cases um, being male. Younger age groups, 34 years has been the median age. And the primary route of transmission has been sexual contact and 86% of cases have been identified in men who have sex with men. So clearly this male to male sexual contact um, is the primary route of transmission during this outbreak. Although we have seen some cases in women and children and men who do not report MMSC, um, and a lot of those are household contacts and are of particular interest to learn more about how those cases are occurring and what the route of transmission is, uh, what's responsible for the spread of uh, virus in those cases. Now, in terms of the classical presentation, Yosh did a great job already presenting this. Um, the firm deep-seated, well-circumscribed, uh, often umbilicated lesions are what we saw classically involving palms and soles and often associated with uh, lymphadenopathy, which is one feature that uh, distinguished it from smallpox where you did not see a lot of significant lymphadenopathy. Um, and in 2003, uh, many of the cases uh, that occurred in that outbreak the first lesions um, were seen at the site of the exposure. So bites or scratches from those prairie dogs is where those first lesions appeared. And what we're seeing globally now is that um, many of the lesions are a little bit more small and localized um, and similar to what we saw in 2003. Um, and there are some other kind of differences that we're seeing during the outbreak compared to classic monkeypox as well. Uh, clearly, the pre previous route of transmission was zoonotic transmission. That, that is not the main driver in the 2022 outbreak. And person-to-person -person spread had occurred previously, uh, but as Yoshi mentioned, was not um, a persistent spread uh, among people. Uh, that's clearly changed in this outbreak. There's extensive person-to-person -person spread in these MSM networks. Uh, with, with forward transmission um, continuing. Uh, in terms of the location of lesions, classically we saw widespread rash. There was some involvement of genitals previously reported, uh, but what we're seeing now in this outbreak is uh, primarily or often limited to uh, genital involvement with some localized rashes and some, um, some widespread rashes as well, but uh, more localized compared to what was seen previously. Now in terms of transmission, as was mentioned, there was respiratory spread previously um, identified. Fomites have been involved in some transmission um, and close skin to skin contact was previously reported as well, but that's been really extensive in this 2022 outbreak. In terms of other diseases that are on the differential, uh, previously, chickenpox was the most commonly um, confused uh, infection, um, uh, confused with monkeypox, um, and co-infections had been seen with, with chickenpox as well. Uh, during this outbreak, um, the differential has been expanded to include a number of other sexually transmitted infections, as well as hand, foot, mouth disease, molluscum contagiosum, um, and a number of others. And we have seen co-infections as well with some of these STIs, uh, which can change the clinical presentation a bit as well. Now, in terms of uh, prevention of zoonotic MPOX, um, the previous messaging has been very difficult. Uh, you know, what we could recommend is avoiding contact with any of those animals that might harbor the virus. Um, that's a difficult message in these endemic areas where these animals serve as uh, a, 
a very important food source and a source of protein. Um, recommending isolating patients is, is obviously appropriate, but difficult in these rural settings where they may not have the facilities to accomplish that. Using PPE is, a port, is important when caring for patients to prevent nosocomial transmission. Oftentimes, unfortunately, that PPE is not available in these um, isolated areas. And then, of course, hand hygiene after contact with any infected animals or humans. Um, that's a key uh, method of preventing uh, secondary transmission as well. And now it was noted that smallpox vaccination did appear to provide uh, protection against disease acquisition in studies that were done um, of secondary transmission uh, during the smallpox eradication era. Uh, where 85% of close contacts of cases appeared to be protected if they were vaccinated um, recently. However, the traditional smallpox vaccines were based on uh, vaccinia virus. They were live viruses, um, replication competent. They're administered using a, a bifurcated needle and a multiple puncture technique, which is uh, unique to smallpox vaccine. And because these are live viruses, they produce a major cutaneous reaction or take, which you can see in this image here. Uh, and these vaccine site lesions were useful in that they were evidence of a successful vaccination. But at the same time, these vaccine site lesions do also contain infectious virus that can be transmitted to other people or to other parts of the body and the vaccine themselves. And there are a number of serious, severe uh, vaccinia virus complications that were seen following uh, vaccination as well. Progressive vaccinia was seen in immunocompromised individuals. Uh, eczema vaccinatum uh, was seen in persons with atopic dermatitis and other skin diseases. Um, fetal vaccinia was documented um, it, with uh, vertical transmission of the virus to the fetus and pregnant women. Um, so a number of uh, very serious uh, life-threatening complications were associated with these uh, traditional replication competent vaccines. And, and that's what's really limited the use of these smallpox vaccines um, in endemic areas where there may be unknown um, incidence prevalence of uh, HIV and other immunocompromising conditions. Um, but fortunately, there have been a number of uh, advances in smallpox vaccines um, in preparing for uh, the possible use of smallpox as a bioterrorism agent. So the first generation smallpox vaccines were actually propagated in calf skin um, and purified virus was taken from the lesions on their skin and um, uh, purified. And um, that is what was used for the first generation vaccines such as Drevex. Um, Avis, Aventus, Pasteur, smallpox vaccine, Lister. The second generation vaccines are taking the same viruses, but using uh, modern good manufacturing practices and tissue culture to propagate those viruses. So decreasing the risk of adventitious agents. Um, and then the next step is this third generation vaccines, which are taking those viruses and attenuating them so that they're still propagated in tissue culture under good manufacturing practices. Uh, but have decreasing um, some of those risks uh, and increasing the safety profile. And there are even now fourth generation vaccines looking at protein subunit vaccines or DNA vaccines, but these are still under development. Um, so Genios is uh, the, the primary third generation vaccine that has been used in the current outbreak. It's an attenuated, non-replicating live virus vaccine um, produced from the strain modified vaccinia Ankara Bavaria Nordic. It's also known as Invimune or Infinex or MVA. It's given as a series of two doses administered 28 days apart. And uh, prior to its licensure, it was tested in over 7,000 human participants. And in particular, um, it was evaluated uh, in persons with HIV and with atopic dermatitis. So those individuals who would be at high risk for complications from the traditional replicating vaccines um, and shown to be safe in those individuals. So no serious adverse events were, were noted in any of the um, development uh, studies for this vaccine. 
And because it's a non-replicating vaccine, that means that there's no take that develops, so no vaccine site lesion. So the risk of uh, inadvertent transmission to others or auto inoculation to other parts of the body uh, does not exist. And also, um, there's no risk of some of those other severe vaccinia virus complications that occurred with uh, uncontrolled replication of uh, vaccinia virus in the body, like progressive vaccinia or eczema vaccinatum. So Junios was licensed by FDA in September 2019 for prevention of both smallpox and monkeypox. And it was more recently licensed by the EMA in July of this year, uh, so during the, the current outbreak. Um, so there have been some challenges in using this vaccine during the outbreak, however, and one of the primary challenges has been the availability. Uh, global supplies of Genios uh, still remain very limited. Um, some developed countries had stockpiled Genios for smallpox preparedness, uh, but even in those countries like the United States, the early demand for this vaccine far exceeded the supply. Uh, more recently, um, PAHO's revolving fund has purchased 130,000 doses, so there is vaccine now available to countries and territories in Latin America and the Caribbean, but there's still persistent um, problems with uh, access to this vaccine for, for many um, developing countries uh, that are not able to uh, purchase this vaccine and, and make it available to their citizens. In terms of administration, the standard regimen that's uh, licensed by FDA is a subcutaneous administration. The injection volume is 0.5 milliliters. Uh, and because of the limited availability, there has been an alternative regimen that's been promoted um, using intradermal administration of Genios uh, using an injection volume of 0.1 milliliter. And this alternative regimen is, uh, has been preferred when feasible because that clearly can increase the number of available vaccine doses. And this uh, encouragement of the intradermal administration was really based on a single clinical study that did show that lower intradermal dose was immunologically non-inferior to the standard subcutaneous regimen. Now, another challenge of using Genios during the outbreak is developing the appropriate vaccination strategy. Um, a lot of thought had previously been put into preparing for smallpox and developing um, uh, policies and strategies for its use, uh, but not as much effort had been put into monkeypox given that this, this type of outbreak was, was not anticipated. And there are significant differences between smallpox and monkeypox so that the strategy that you would pursue for smallpox is, is definitely different for monkeypox given that Monkeypox is a generally less virulent disease, lower case fatality rate, so very much different um, uh, uh, risk benefit analyses that go into these strategies. And in terms of the United States, the initial vaccination strategy was pursuing a post-exposure prophylaxis strategy where persons with known exposures to the virus would be recommended vaccination. And it was uh, pretty quickly um, uh, recognized that contact tracing in these, um, in these networks was very difficult and identifying those exposed individuals was difficult as well. And uh, the strategy was brought to an expanded post-exposure prophylaxis or PET++ strategy, where not just known um, contacts would be recommended vaccination, but also those who have presumed to have had an exposure based on certain um, behaviors or risk criteria were also recommended um, vaccination. And so as the outbreak uh, um, as the outbreak continued, the strategy, the strategy uh, continued to evolve with the um, outbreak and with the availability of vaccine. So finally pre-exposure prophylaxis where um, recommendation of vaccination before exposure for eligible populations um, has been recommended at this point now that uh, the uh, supply of a vaccine has um, increased. And this is consistent with um, WHO's uh, interim guidance for vaccine use, where they also recommend post-exposure prophylaxis, but at pre-exposure prophylaxis for essentially the same group of high-risk uh, individuals. Now to talk a little bit about the 
experience using Genios uh, in the United States. More than a million doses have been administered. Um, you can see uh, very early on, there was an increase and very high demand um, for vaccine. It peaked around the same time that cases peaked and uh, has continued to decrease as our cases have decreased as well. Um, the demographics of individuals who are receiving vaccine are very similar to the demographics of uh, the cases that we're seeing, primarily male, um, primarily um, young and middle-aged adults, although we have do have some experience using the vaccine in uh, pediatric age groups as well as older individuals. And we've been uh, attempting to closely track its use uh, in uh, different uh, races and ethnicities to ensure as much of, as possible an equitable uh, use of the vaccine um, for these uh, vulnerable uh, populations. And so we're now getting some data coming in as well to really evaluate effectiveness, which um, had not previously been done with this vaccine. It was developed for smallpox. Um, no true efficacy studies had been done, and these were actually licensed based on um, comparing immunogenicity to previously licensed vaccines. Um, however, the, the uh, preliminary analyses that have been done in the United States, um, looking at incidents of monkeypox cases and more than 5,000 monkeypox cases, has shown that um, incidence was 14 times higher among unvaccinated males compared to those who had received at least one uh, dose of vaccine more than 14 days earlier. So some very early um, strong evidence of effectiveness um, and some uh, additional studies are being done in other countries as well. Um, in Israel, for example, uh, observational study uh, estimating vaccine efficacy at 79%, but given low numbers, a very wide confidence interval of 24 to 94%. Um, and another study, for example, from France, uh, looking at post-exposure vaccination, um, where only 12 uh, confirmed monkeypox cases um, in vaccinated individuals were identified um, uh, among 276 individuals who had been uh, vaccinated. So some, some evidence of uh, effectiveness of post-exposure prophylaxis as well, uh, but also evidence of some breakthrough infections. So we're hopeful that more of this data will be coming in and that with these uh, continued analyses, we'll get a much better handle on um, true vaccine efficacy uh, from the experience using this vaccine during the outbreak. Now, I'll just mention that there are uh, treatments available for uh, MPOX uh, in Unfortunately, we have seen some very severe cases and fatalities in uh, largely immunocompromised individuals, uh, but most immunocompetent patients do recover with just pain management and other supportive care. So treatment we are recommending should be considered for some conditions. Obviously, those who have severe disease um, should, should consider treatment. Um, persons who have lesions involving anatomic areas that could cause this serious sequelae like scarring or stricture should also consider um, being treated. And lastly, people who are at risk for high, uh, who are at high risk for severe disease. So those with immunocompromised or pregnant women, for example, um, should also uh, consider being treated uh, for monkey, for MPOX. Um, the primary treatment modality during the outbreak has been Ticavirmat. This is an, a small molecule antiviral medication developed to treat smallpox and, and licensed by FDA uh, to treat smallpox. Um, and it has been made available under an expanded access investigational new drug protocol um, in the United States where it was stockpiled and has been uh, prescribed or treated to uh, 6,293 patients have been prescribed or treated with Ticavirmat in the U.S. And anecdotally, um, some encouraging um, evidence uh, for um, effectiveness and, and benefit, uh, but truly the, the uh, efficacy of Ticavirmat has not yet been proven, and there are ongoing um, clinical trials um, using uh, more rigorous study designs with randomization and blinding um, to uh, really define what the efficacy of Tikavirmat is in treating 
um, and pox. Now, there are a number of other treatment options. Too many. Great. Perfect, thank you. I'm just finishing up here. So there are a number of other treatment options available. Sidofovir and brinsidofovir are also small molecule antiviral medications um, that have activity against oral to pox viruses. Um, vaccinia immune globulin um, is an intravenous uh, um, purified antibody product that is licensed by FDA for treatment of complications due to vaccinia vaccination, but may have some role um, in treating MPOX. And also uh, trifluoridine is an antiviral medication that's available in a, topic, uh, a formulation, topical formulation that has been used to treat um, ocular infections of vaccinia virus previously and of ocular uh, mpox in this outbreak. So there are a number of other options available as alternative treatments or adjunctive treatments in some of these very severe cases. So in summary, the global outbreak is uh, ongoing. It's predominantly affecting uh, men who have sex with men. Sexual contact has been the most common route of transmission. And luckily we've not seen any sustained transmission in communities outside of these MSM networks uh, or in uh, animals as uh, Yoshi mentioned. We have seen severe cases and deaths among um, immunocompromised individuals. Vaccines are available for prevention, um, but we still don't have the vaccine efficacy de uh, well defined for MPOX. And there are a number of outstanding questions about duration of protection for vaccine, um, its use uh, with intradermal administration, a number of other questions. Therapeutics are off, also available for treatment, but the effectiveness of these agents has not been proven. And there's still outstanding questions about what the optimal clinical utilization, utilization of these products is for, for these severe cases, for example. So I will stop there, but uh, look forward to questions and uh, participating in the panel discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad, and I hand over to Kamel now. Thank you very much, Joris. Uh, thanks, thanks, Brad. Uh, thanks, Yoshi, for those very interesting presentation with a lot of details on uh, how the outbreak has evolved from uh, uh, some uh, occurrences of cases uh, linked to uh, zoonosis to human-to-human uh, -human transmission. So let me let me first ask uh, uh, in this panel discussion ask a question uh, to uh, Jean-Marie Probelet, who has been uh, not only the chair of the IHR uh, group on monkeypox, but as he reminded us, he started uh, his career uh, also with some monkeypox outbreaks in, uh, in uh, DR Congo a few years ago. So um, Jean-Marie, um, maybe you want to give us a bit of uh, an overview of what was discussed and what were the, the, the decisions made in the IHR committee and how the strategy that is proposed by WHO uh, has evolved uh, to, uh, to respond to those specific uh, risk group and, and targets of, of, of those uh, this outbreak. To you, Jomai. Uh, thank you, Kamel. Thank you for having me uh, in this uh, session. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, agree with you that uh, we had uh, great uh, presentations, uh, you know, giving us. Um, a good over overview of the disease itself, but also, um, you know, um, issues and features uh, with regard to the current um, multi-country um, uh, outbreak. Um, I, I think um, you, you, you said it well, um, the outbreak that we are currently experiencing um, is linked to clade 2 and that uh, it's the, the, the main uh, uh, way, the main um, component in terms of, uh, you know, the spread of the disease is uh, through human to human uh, transmission. I think Brett has uh, insisted on it. Um, so as we know, when we have human to human um, transmission, um, one can uh, implement a number of uh, public health measures um, you know, including surveillance, um, early case de detection, diagnostic uh, and, and uh, care and contact tracing um, uh, so, so that, you know, you, you can break the transmission. Um, and the, 
as, as we noticed uh, in, during the meetings and deliberation of the emergency committee, uh, in the case of the current outbreak, we do indeed have um, this specificity that um, this uh, spread is uh, affecting mainly uh, the MSM group. So it's a specific community which is particularly affected. And therefore, uh, I, I think um, the uh, addressing these through uh, behavior changes um, is, is an important um, uh, component of the strategies that have been adopted by countries, um, you know, in uh, trying to, um, you know, uh, uh, cut, off, cut the transmission, stop the transmission of the, the infection. Um, I remember, you know, the Director General was uh, saying that, uh, you know, this outbreak can be stopped with the right strategies in the right groups. Um, and indeed, um, in some countries, you know, the experiences uh, are shown that, uh, you know, implementation of these strategies um, uh, uh, is, is um, giving us very good results, as uh, Brett um, um, alluded to. Um, the, we, what we notice also uh, in the emergency committee is the fact that uh, WHO has been truly quite good um, and has been on top of this. Um, if you go to the website, um, you know, already at the time of the first meeting we had in June, we had uh, plenty of technical docu uh, documentation, doc technical guidance. Um, for countries to use so that you know they can um, identify the cases and then uh, stop uh, work towards to stopping transmission. So um, WHO did a very uh, diligent uh, job in in uh, having those technical materials out. Uh, WHO did well in um, facilitating you know um, the um, meetings of. Um, you know, key uh, researchers and people who know about uh, mon uh, monkeypox and 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 uh, you know um, um, and, and 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 they have identified uh, all the gaps uh, in um, uh, research um, that uh, uh, they, they were put forward so that you know we can have uh, we can accumulate as many. Uh, solutions uh, as possible uh, in stopping this uh, outbreak. Um, the WHO strategic plan uh, is is pretty good. Um, it has three objectives: um, stopping human to human transmission, protecting the vulnerable because that's important. Uh, we it was important that uh, or it's still important that we. Uh, prevent, you know, uh, the spill of, of, of this uh, infection into, uh, you know, vulnerable populations, and then obviously uh, minimizing zoonotic transmission. But, um, Kamel, I must say that, um, you know, while overall the emergency committee was satisfied with um, um, the way WHO, um, you know, handled this, um, and the way many countries, um, you know, have implemented some of the uh, public health measures, including, um, as we heard, uh, use of vaccines. We also did recognize that uh, and express concern on, over the, you know, the continuing uh, inequities. Um, you know, uh, countries, especially in Africa, um, did not have uh, uh, access to diagnostic facilities, to therapeutics, and let alone to to vaccine. So um, that emerging inequity um, was um, uh, uh, no, put forward in, as one of the, the key concerns uh, by the emergency committee. Um, but at the same time, we uh, felt that uh, some of these countries have to do better in terms of uh, you know improving the way they would manage issues related to human rights, uh, to reducing stigma uh, so that one can facilitate access to uh, health services uh, you know, by uh, those in the communities that are most affected. 
And finally, um, the issue of data uh, was also stressed. Uh, while overall, uh, the data that we had um, reviewed uh, were of, uh, you know, of moderate um, level, but the uh, from from Africa, it was difficult to to have uh, you know good information about what was happening with regard to monkey uh, monkeypox transmission. To what extent, for instance, uh, what could um, establish or ruled out um, human to human transmission, including through intimate and sexual contact in Africa, uh, even with clade one. So some of these. Um, uh, points were put forward in uh, some of our uh, uh, reports and uh, in short overall a uh, good response but um, obviously uh, you know when it comes to um, implementation at country level you then see uh, differences some high income countries um, you know going full fledged with the implementation of strategies and doing well Others not so good, but uh, definitely in the developing countries in Africa, especially, um, a lot still need to be done. Thank you. Thanks, Jean Marie, for the perspective that you just gave uh, regarding the outbreaks in uh, LMICs. And uh, it, it has indeed to be noted that uh, even if the outbreak has evolved to be more an MSM uh, transmission mode. In, uh, in the countries that have faced outbreak recently, it's true that we probably have uh, underestimation of the cases, number of cases in countries where diagnostic uh, capacities are reduced. Um, and again, uh, to make a, a, a comparison to COVID is uh, probably the similar issues that we are facing here. So let me turn to you, Brett, um, to ask you regarding that. What, what about uh, all the risks Groups. Uh, you mentioned MSM because the outbreaks are, uh, are mainly uh, identified in the high-income countries in those groups. Do we have more um, data regarding uh, potentially other groups that can be uh, also at risk uh, for, for this outbreak? And this, the second question I'm asking immediately because Jean-Marie uh, mentioned this issue of equity, equitable access to the vaccine, which is only of course, one element of the of the public health response, but a key one. Um, we we saw that at the beginning of this outbreak, again, like we like for COVID, we're also facing uh, some issues uh, for countries to have access to uh, the stock of vaccine. Um, maybe you can share your thoughts regarding um, this uh, lack of availability of vaccine. So those two questions. Thank you. Sure, great. So thanks for those questions. Uh, to start with the first question about, you know, other risk groups, I think in the current outbreak, um, it has been largely and disproportionately affecting um, men who have sex with men. I think that's been clear, but we have seen cases um, among women, children, there have been cases in pregnant women. Um, so clearly there are other uh, groups at risk I think we need to focus more on those cases outside of the uh, major risk group, the MSM risk group, um, to learn more about how those individuals are being um, infected, uh, what the route of transmission is, what those risk factors are. Um, and I think some of that information could help some of our uh, messaging for prevention. Um, fortunately, we have not seen um, uh, the virus moving into some of the other vulnerable populations that were, we were worried about. Um, there have been some cases among prisoners, but we've not seen sustained transmission among prison populations. Um, in the United States, there have been some uh, cases among homeless individuals, but again, uh, no evidence of persistent transmission in, in some of those populations. So I think we have been fortunate that um, uh, the, the transmission has not um, expanded uh, significantly to these other um, high-risk groups, uh, but I think there, there is still that risk that it could occur. So learning as much as we can about these routes of transmission and what those risk factors are um, would be ideal to preventing uh, another shift in the epidemiology of MPOX into these other uh, vulnerable populations. 
Um, and then moving to your second question about equitable access to vaccine and other medical countermeasures, I think that has been a, a significant problem in this outbreak. Uh, I think we are fortunate um, that uh, at the start of the outbreak, we did have a lot of tools um, at our disposal, uh, largely due to investments in preparing for smallpox. Um, so all of the diagnostic assays, the vaccines, the antivirals that were developed um, in anticipation of a possible bioterror event um, involving smallpox, uh, were also available um, for monkeypox. And, and because of the rela relatedness of the viruses and being in the same genus, um, all of those medical countermeasures uh, could also be applied to uh, MPOX. Um, so it was great that we were in that situation, but unfortunately, as has been uh, already pointed out, uh, we've not had equal access to all of those medical countermeasures um, on a global scale. Uh, and so that's something that clearly needs some um, additional uh, work to increase access. I think some of the, as I mentioned, the uh, purchase of vaccines by PAHO's revolving fund, some other mechanisms like that that uh, may increase access uh, among these LMIC countries um, to some of these medical countermeasures um, are, are positive developments. And I think more efforts like that uh, need to be pursued um, to ensure that these medical countermeasures are available to all people who are um, at risk for this disease. Thanks, Brett. And uh, before handing over to Yoris uh, regarding the second part of this panel discussion, let me ask you another question, Brett. Uh, you mentioned the Genius vaccine that was the, the, the vaccine of choice for um, the response uh, in USA and in other countries uh, with the strategy of uh, pre-exposure and, and post-exposure um, prevention. Um, you also mentioned the existence of other vaccines uh, using uh, different technology. Um, what are the perspectives here, if you can uh, uh, highlight a bit a few, a few uh, key uh, highlights on, on those other vaccines for the near future uh, for the outbreak response? Sure, so I, I kind of went through some of the details on the first, second, and third generations. The, the first and second generation vaccines being replicating vaccines, all of those pose a risk of uh, severe vaccine complications in immunocompromised individuals or others with um, skin conditions. Um, and uh, for largely that reason that has limited its use um, for prevention of monkeypox, both in endemic areas and during the outbreak. So it was a bit of a difficult um, risk benefit analysis, uh, initially um, deciding which vaccines would be appropriate for use. Um, on the one hand, we have the first and second generation vaccines, which are um, have the most uh, efficacy data, given that uh, those vaccines were directly used or the, the direct descendants of those vaccines um, were used uh, to eradicate uh, a disease. So clear evidence of uh, efficacy for those replicating vaccines, um, as opposed to the third generation vaccines, Genius being the primary example, um, where they were licensed based on, uh, as I mentioned, immunogenicity data showing non-inferior immune responses, humoral immune responses to those uh, previous uh, vaccines. Uh, however, they'd never been tested um, in clinical trials uh, to show efficacy um, against a uh, naturally circulating virus. There was only one study uh, that actually used these vaccines in endemic areas. And this, was not a, this was a CDC study. It was not a case control study aimed at conclusively proving efficacy, um, rather showing effectiveness and that it could be used in these endemic areas. So there certainly were some questions about um, effectiveness uh, early on. So balancing the risk of severe disease from MPOX uh, versus potentially severe vaccine complications versus um, uncertain efficacy, it, it was a very difficult balancing act early on to um, you know, guide some of those uh, vaccine recommendations between the different vaccines that were available. Thanks, Brett. 
Um, and last question, uh, you always before handing over to you, Jean-Marie. I mean, you've been involved in uh, in past in the past into um, setting up stockpiles for vaccines um, and also for treatments uh, for some diseases. Um, was that part of the discussion um, at WHO uh, in the IHR committee or outside of the IHR committee? Absolutely. Um, yes. Uh, the the issue of um, you know access to vaccine, um, you know, or the limited supply of vaccine, um, was in the center of uh, discussions, as you can imagine, uh, at some point. Um, uh, especially um, uh, given the fact that you know we were looking at the ways uh, low middle income countries that are mainly affected could um, you know access some of these products. Um, the uh, we did ask WHO whether you know they could um, uh, mobilize uh, some of the mechanisms that they have. For instance, the the ICG uh, International Coordination Make a Group, um, you know, that deal with uh, you know the, um, the 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 allocation of um, limited supplies uh, of products such as vaccines. Um, but, but um, you know, um, they simply said that, uh, you know, uh, that was not yet um, possible, uh, given the fact that, uh, you know, uh, they had to acquire even a, mi uh, a minimum stock um, that uh, they could then handle eventually uh, and, and then pass on to uh, some of the countries that are in need. Um, and, and let alone, you know, um, thinking about mechanisms such as the, you know, act accelerators or, or whatever um, uh, mechanism that have been put in place recently uh, for COVID vaccine. Um, so well, truly that remains uh, a problem um, and, and, and partly because certainly of limited uh, production, but also um, over, overall, um, you know, um, limited amount of um, uh, resources uh, that one could um, access so that, um, you know, we can accelerate um, the availability of some of these products that are badly needed. Um, the, one of the key concerns uh, moving forward is obviously to ensure that, uh, you know, at the source of infection, uh, there is adequate control. Um, you did say that uh, I worked on this program 40 years ago here in the DRC. Um, but, you know, um, 40 years later, we're still there. Um, 40 years ago, we were looking first time at the understanding of natural history of monkeypox. Uh, and 40 years later, we still have uh, cases um, and outbreaks um, here and there, um, you know, without um, much being done for the control. Um, I don't want to blame anybody, but uh, clearly, um, where we put our priorities can be uh, really uh, discussed internationally, um, given some of the potential, um, you know, implications of some of these emerging diseases. Uh, I, I think there is a, a, a good call there uh, for the international community to pay attention and for uh, the countries affected uh, to allocate uh, resources, including human resources, um, to do adequate uh, surveillance at the minimum. Um, we, we know the, the, the word deaths um, associated with monkeypox, uh, but if you ask for data about uh, what are the, you know, uh, what's the profile of those people uh, that this deceased, you will not get the information because there was almost no investigation done. That's, that's not good. Thanks, Jean-Marie, you're doing the perfect uh, transition to, uh, to Yoris, who's uh, going to discuss uh, typically uh, this relation, uh, human and animal health, and, and what we need to do better to you, Yoris. Thank you, uh, Kamel. And um, uh, again, thank you to the, um, the two speakers for their excellent presentations and the excellent transition made by uh, uh, Jean-Marie. Um, indeed, when we see that even, even today, and then I come to the questions, uh, as Jean-Marie so clearly explained in the DRC, but uh, that's only an example, we see it in many other diseases, uh, where we 
still are running behind a problem that occurs. So the first question, in fact, and uh, I would like to extend the question to the um, to the people who are uh, um, linked in by um, by the webinar. Um, uh, um, the first question is, in fact, what can we do better in order to anticipate? And uh, a first very important point, uh, what can we do more to study better viruses which are circulating in, the, in, in animals with potential to spill over to uh, the human population and probably the reverse? Um, may I first pose the question to, uh, well, probably to Jean-Marie, uh, because he, he just tended the, uh, the stick in order to put into that direction. Um, well, this is an area that um, uh, certainly uh, others have worked on and, and will reflect better, you know, the whole of uh, one health approach. Um, you know, um, came in as we were towards the end of our career. But nevertheless, uh, I, I think the, the important thing here uh, is to, to, to get multidisciplinary uh, teams to, to, uh, in place uh, as part of, uh, you know, uh, the teams that countries have to establish for preparedness, detection, and, and response uh, to um, uh, emerging diseases and to um, outbreaks. The um, it, it, on the WHO side, uh, side sorry, uh, the uh, uh, R and D research and development blueprint site. Um, you know, people can see um, uh, some of the presentations that were made uh, during a webinar uh, that was uh, organized in June this year. Um, and among the presentations done, I was impressed by the one from a, a group in Central African Republic working under the Institut Pasteur there, where, uh, you know, they, they showed how uh, efficient uh, it, it was to do intervention uh, with, uh, you know, a multidisciplinary approach. Um, they, the efficiency was rated to be, you know, uh, Quite extremely good, and 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 the the, the um, disciplines that uh, are concerned are those that Yoshi mentioned, uh, including zoology, obviously, you know, looking at the ecology, you know, um, the human activities and so on. But also, and Yoshi said that anthropological investigation, you know, how people behave and why they behave in a certain manner, you know, in relation to these, uh, the contact with uh, these animals and so on. And obviously virology and epidemiology. So, uh, so five disciplines to come together and, and they've shown that uh, working together like that way and going backward, uh, uh, investigating some of the 40 plus outbreaks of monkeypox, um, they could, um, you know, generate quite some uh, good information. Um, but that's to me, uh, the, the way forward and, and one of the things that uh, countries have to put in place. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Marie. I uh, uh, look at Brett. Uh, do you have some parallels? Do you see some parallels here in anticipation, monkeypox and what we experienced with COVID, Brett? Yeah, I think there are. Uh, and, and just going back to the to the last question of, you know, what can we do to, to better anticipate and prepare? You know, I think there were warning signs uh, about the risk of MPOX um, previous. You know, we've been seeing increasing number of cases um, in the endemic areas. We knew that uh, routine vaccination with smallpox had left many more people um, vulnerable uh, to this disease. Uh, the outbreak in Nigeria in 2017, I think, was a wake-up call that um, this disease did have outbreak potential, and the continuing cases in Nigeria, as well as the exported cases to other countries from Nigeria, I think may have been um, some missed warning signs there that um, there was something brewing. Uh, and uh, I, I think if we heed those warnings better in the future and uh, uh, pay more attention and um, effort to building those surveillance systems to 
uh, identify uh, those um, new developments with emerging diseases, I think that would uh, put us in much better stead. Now, with regards to um, some of the similarities with COVID, I, I think there are definitely some um, similar challenges that we faced with MPOX compared to COVID. For example, uh, both vaccines are two-dose regimens. So early on with limited vaccine supply, uh, do you push a strategy for uh, giving out as many first doses as possible and delaying the second dose? Or do you uh, recommend you know, everyone do their best to complete the two doses? We had this, the same um, challenge with MPOX as uh, public health uh, professionals did with COVID in that respect. Um, so I think there are a number of parallels and some lessons learned that, that uh, could uh, apply in, in future outbreaks as well. That's just one example. Thank you very much, Brett. There, there you, you push me to a bunch of questions uh, when it's about uh, uh, vaccine availability. So one of the questions we can pose, and I would like uh, that people who are uh, um, connected that they intervene as well that they pose their questions i do not see anything on the on 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 the chat but please uh, feel free to uh, raise your hands and uh, we will try to uh, to take up your questions so on vaccine availability so there a first question both on animal and on the human side uh, is it not a question where we should anticipate better where we should have uh, production facilities in order to be prepared. So we are in a world where uh, a production facility that is not running vaccines for sales, uh, that it is not running so, and because it is, it is not running, it is not prepared in order to take up. Um, what can we do better there? And then I have a second question probably uh, to uh, Yogi. So uh, I know there is a very important project in order to uh, strengthened particularly in Africa, 15,000 animal health specialists in order to detect earlier diseases in, in animals, but for unknown reasons. Uh, this is a project that is already, well, we try to run that project for more than almost 10 years now, and uh, there is just no funding for that. So uh, how can we tackle uh, those questions? Um, First on the vaccine availability uh, point, and then I would like to come back to the next one. Yoji, do you have some, you, you, you surely have some bright ideas on that. So, so this is Brett, I, I can give some comments first on the vaccine availability. Yeah. I mean, I think that's one, one clear uh, other similarity with COVID uh, uh, where there's clearly limited vaccine availability early on in the outbreak, a uh, bit different situation in that these vaccines had already been developed, uh, but we did not have the, the production capacity or, or the stockpile in place um, to meet the needs of the outbreak. But clearly this outbreak was, was not anticipated and was not foreseen. Um, so it's, it's a bit difficult to you know, go back and in hindsight um, fault folks for, for not putting that in place. But at the same time, some of the same manufacturing and production issues that we saw with COVID in terms of you know, fill finish uh, man, uh, facilities, came into play with MPOX as well. So I, I think there are you know, common stumbling blocks that we're encountering um, from outbreak to outbreak that have still not been addressed. How to address them? So I, I don't have an easy solution to that. Um, uh, you know, that, that's not my, exactly my area of expertise, but, you know, clearly fill finish, there's only so much global capacity. Uh, and with, you know, the increasing number of uh, outbreaks of infectious diseases that we've seen, it does seem like investments in um, uh, maintaining some of these uh, warm bases for vaccine production uh, would be prudent uh, moving forward. Okay, to come back to the question of um, capacity of uh, detection, early warnings, etc. Yoji. Sorry. Yoris, before we move to the other part of the question, on the issue of uh, 
you know, uh, vaccine availability, production, stockpiling. You know, I, I think there is need for inadequate uh, debate here. Um, if I take the example of, uh, you know, Ebola vaccines, um, you know, we have a stockpile of um, Ebola vaccines, um, but what's the amount of, uh, you know, um, the size of the stockpile? What should it be? Uh, how, how long should, should it be? How long? Sorry. Yes. How long should one uh, keep this? And what do you do in the entire epidemic period with uh, such a stock of vaccine? Um, and, and so the, the, the management of, uh, you know, um, vaccines in relation with some of these rare diseases, but that are uh, important ones on the public health side when they do occur, I think that's that's a debate that one has to have because um, you know it, it's not a, a usual the usual way that one uh, maintain um, you know um, vaccines available. Um, uh, given the fact that at the end of the day uh, we're talking about um, uh, rare diseases, for this one you know uh, we're talking about uh, community at this point in time. Um, limited um, groups of people being affected and so on and so forth. So um, I wanted just to put it on the table that uh, that's a debate that uh, needs to take place as to how one manages uh, some of the, the, uh, the vaccines with regard to these uh, emerging diseases um, that are occurring here and there. Thank you, uh, Jean-Marie. That's uh surely a very important debate that uh, should take place uh, uh, ideally on a, on a global strategic level um is there i see here a question any uh subairo ilyasu is there any influence of covid vaccine hesitancy attitude towards monkeypox vaccine who will take this up yeah, so this is Brett. I, I can make some comments on that. I think, you know, there initially was uh, quite a bit of concern that um, there could be some vaccine hesitancy. Uh, what we saw actually initially was the, the exact opposite. Uh, among the high risk individuals, the men who have sex with men, there was uh, a lot of demand for vaccine. In fact, they were clamoring for vaccine um, and we did not have the supplies to, to meet that demand. Um, however, the, the demand was largely for the third generation vaccine, the Genios vaccine, which is, uh, has a much more favorable safety profile among public health professionals. There was concern that if the second generation vaccines, the replicating vaccines were used and there was severe vaccine complications, um, uh, that occurred that that might lead to increased hesitancy. So I think there was a lot of um, hesitancy to actually use those uh, replicating vaccines for prevention of monkeypox. Again, that risk benefit analysis, um, if, if you had a severe vaccine complication and that increased hesitancy for all the vaccines, uh, that could be deleterious to the response um, at large. Um, and uh, I, for that reason, again, Genios was really the only vaccine used uh, for prevention of MPOX in this outbreak. And to my knowledge, none of the replicating vaccines uh, ended up being used uh, specifically to prevent MPOX. Okay, thank you, Brett. Any other remarks on, on that? Then... Um... I would then pass to the um, a second uh, question, which is uh, the anticipation, early warning systems, uh, sufficient data, uh, scientific data on uh, new viruses in the um, animal um, in the animal population. Who takes that up? Yoji? Uh, I can I can start start the the conversation. Uh, I won't cover everything, but yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, that's that's a, a, a huge field, right? Trying to uh, understand and study animal about diseases in animals. Um, 
And I think as uh, Jim Marie has uh, mentioned, the One Health approach has helped a lot uh, bridging, bridging between um, animal health and human health. But I think there's, as he also mentioned, is 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 still needs a lot of um, a lot of support, a lot of resources, and a lot of uh, a lot of growing in terms of of, of uh, integrating more of the uh, multidisciplinary uh, approach, as we have mentioned before, uh, at least uh, uh, anthropological stories or virologists and and everything. I think what you mentioned about animal health specialists and where it should be placed. I think uh, those. I I do think they they need to be integrated in the whole systems within inside the the, uh, the uh, ministries of health, the ministries of agriculture in 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 each country in all all of these countries and and actually have countries uh, put um, resources and put the 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 priority or give the importance of that surveillance, which unfortunately it is it is very it could be very resource intensive, right? Um, I mean, comparing to other zoonoses or other diseases that could happen in, or, or in, in animals, in domesticated animals, I'm sure uh, ministries of uh, agriculture have a good surveillance of those. But when we talk about um, what, uh, uh, diseases or viruses or pathogens that are uh, transmitted within uh, wildlife animals, then, um, well, first, uh, if we know what animals are transmitting, then maybe more focused um, efforts. But uh, in the case of monkeypox, for example, which we still don't know exactly what species are, it may be more of a broader spectrum uh, effort with more resources. Um, I yeah I I do emphasize I think the multidisciplinary uh, approach is, is 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 key fundamental going forward. Um, Thank you. I see an interesting question there from Philippe Duclos. Do we need more resources, or actually are more removing or artificial barriers? For example, should we have more veterinarians in a course like Advac? Um, um, I, I would like to start the answer to that. So coming back on the reference I mentioned uh, in my introduction, uh, that they also made an economic um, appraisal and they compared the loss if only one pandemic happens or even a small one, what it costs uh, translated into dollars on billions of dollars compared to the investment in, um, in human resources, in uh, infrastructure uh, globally, particularly in low and middle income countries in order to anticipate more. Well, that's only a, a, a minor fraction of what a pandemic can, can cost. So uh, that's, that's, I, I I believe that this economic aspect to our political decision makers who finally have to decide whether they invest in that or not is a very important one. Um, um, who wants to um, react to that and who wants to, uh, to complement? What are the arguments we can use? Well, I would say, what are the arguments we can use better in order to 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 bring this higher up? No idea on this complicated question. Well, I can say that uh, in my experience, um, there has been some very interesting um, trials to do that. Uh, when I come back to very well-known zoonosis, it's um, rabies. We all know that we have the vaccines available uh, in the human as well as in the, in the, in the animal uh, sector. And uh, even if we would vaccinate 
all the domestic uh, animals, dogs, cats, etc., and we can also vaccinate wildlife, we could eliminate rabies within 10 years, but it just doesn't happen. And it's more than 60,000 children who die every year. So what should be done to, uh, to do that? Yeah, that's a very complicated question. I think in in in, in multiple or uh, impacts we also see something similar, right? Since it's a very kind of rare disease uh, in uh, forested areas in, in Africa, also. Uh, well, before this outbreak, uh, then making that argument of more uh, uh, intense um, surveillance or more intense. Uh, um, interventions to, to control the disease is, is always been a challenge um, waiting, as you were saying, benefits and costs. Um, I see another question coming in now from Judith van Holten. Are vaccines being used in West and Central Africa? And what could be done to increase access to vaccines in those countries? Um, Philippe Duclos raises his hand. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I wanted to come back on this issue of, uh, of, of what can be done to, uh, to try to uh, uh, basically uh, increase what is done for animal disease and the, and the profile. And first for rabies, I think let, let's not forget that, that um, um, I mean, first we have the issue in in uh, in pets in domestic animals um, or or cattle and then we have the issue in the in the wildlife and it's of course much more difficult to tackle the wildlife um, but there have been good examples you take rabies around the world where actually rabies has been controlled in a number of countries um, and where there have been intensive efforts in, in on some continents um, but where um, we have the same problems with that type of control that we have with immunization in some uh, low and middle income countries where resources are lagging. And at the end, that, that, that comes back to the, the, the main issue that there are no resources, that there is no attention up to one. Uh, it's a disaster. And, and I think in a way, one does not contrast enough the, what you were talking about before, the economic benefits of dealing with the disease in animals and the impact it may have in humans uh, and the cost of dealing with the, with the disease and the development of immunization programs in humans. Then the other point I wanted to, 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 to bring into the, the, the picture, and, and I'm doing that as a, as a vet and having been uh, affected on personal grounds by, uh, by uh, uh, a, a, a disease which is not recognized as a zoonotic disease, but which probably is, uh, but certainly orphan, is the fact that there's no attention to the risk of transmission of animal disease in humans. Uh, there are no study up to when basically we are in a disaster situation. And I think that has been the case very much for, for monkeypox in a way. And now what's given it much prominence. Uh, again, it has it has been served by the more attention given to Ebola, by the more attention given to 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 many things, but not by itself. And it's only because we have this 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 big outbreak that has gone out and 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 in human to human transmission that there is attention. So if something is really orphan, could happen, but doesn't happen much. There's absolutely no resource whatsoever for interaction between veterinarians, physicians, scientists, and to try to proactively learn what may eventually translate uh, from animals to, to, to humans and vice versa. And I think this is important to keep in mind because some of, of what also we have, we have uh, uh, basically heard from, from Yoshi is, is, is that, you know, this outbreak in the human may transfer back into animals and, 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 and different species of animal and, and spread that way. So again, I argue that, that uh, and that was my point before, that we still have too many vertical barriers 
you know, I ended up working at WHO in immunization, but but on average, we, we still have a divide and, and we have it in many countries. And I would say that the countries that are succeeding the best are the countries where there is less of an administrative divide. And there is no reason for the for this uh, uh, divide to be. And, and, you know, being in charge of ADVAC for now, I would argue that it has always been challenging to accept veterinarians in the program. And, and, and we, we always kind of, with the selection committee, argue that it's, it's less of an impact or, or the course is not suited for veterinarians. But, you know, learning uh, and, and, and crossbreeding and, and, and learning from each other's experience can be extremely, uh, extremely useful, I would think. And what I'm saying about ADVAC probably applies to other courses and it applies also to veterinarian courses where you don't uh, have people that are, are dealing with uh, with human health. And I also think that somehow we need some resources. Uh, same thing as stockpiling a vaccine. Oko was telling us it costs money. You know, you, you have to replenish the, the, the stockpile. It's, it, it's challenging. But we need to also find a bit of money for trying to understand better upfront what may be lurking on the on the horizon. I would argue there's just no money there because it's of no interest to anybody. Maybe I'm wrong and I hope that that one of you will contradict me. Over. Well, if you like, I can shortly take this up, but uh, indeed that would be a very good uh, ad hoc morning or afternoon, but that's another discussion. So uh, on the stockpiling, it's uh, uh, very cheap compared to what you can prevent and uh, you can do a lot of economic studies on that. Um, secondly, um, uh, and this comes to the questions I wanted to pose, uh, are the what are the perspectives for better collaboration under the One Health umbrella? I know that at WHO and at World Organization for Animal Health, there are some efforts but we see so few, so few in the field. And the example you mentioned, uh, Philippe, on, uh, um, on, on, on threat of animal viruses for humans, well, uh, we, we, we only look at it if it is too late. Huh? So uh, how can we prevent? And if we, could pre if, if, we could, if we could better prevent, then we, I am sure we could better also prevent the emergence even of uh, uh, pandemics. But how to do that? That's a, that, that, that's a whole uh, question. And uh, I dream to see WHO and the World Organization of Animal Health working closer to, uh, together on that in order to translate it in, 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 in the field as one common fight, in fact. And uh, you are totally right that there are a lot of, in some countries and a lot of countries, unfortunately, this huge barrier between human and uh, veterinary medicine, which uh, which is very detrimental. And um, in a in a previous life, we we also witnessed that uh, where there is community also on vaccine production, where uh, both sides can learn from each other in order to make more competitive vaccines, better vaccines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there is a lot to do for sure. Uh, are there? Uh, I want to ask a question to Okwo. Uh, the question here that has been posed on the access uh, to vaccines in uh, Africa. Um, can you react to that, um, Okwo? How can we do that better? We have- yeah, so The question is um, whether vaccines are being used in Western Central Africa and what could be done to increase access to vaccine. Okay. Well, uh, for the first part, um, are vaccine be used in the context of the current uh, outbreak? The short answer is no. There is no va vaccine being used uh, here. Um, there are clinical trials uh, being done, um, and, and for which we need, uh, you know, uh, to get them completed so that we can learn more. Uh, but to the other, to answer well this question. Um, uh, actually, I would, uh, you know, raise the issue of, um, you know, what do we know today about um, those vaccines in the zoonotic transmission settings? Um, how, you know, what, what is it that one would like to get to uh, when using the vaccines? 
um, you know, uh, what, what, what is the, the, the end point of the current vaccines? Uh, Brett uh, did uh, refer to some of these um, uh, points that are still unknown. Um, we still are studying the effectiveness, uh, the efficacy of these vaccines. And, and if you put some of those, uh, the, the current knowledge uh, in the settings you are referring to now, um, then you know, what is it that we, one would like to reach? Um, you know, is it um, you know, a kind of uh, preventing infection? And if that's the case, um, what do you vaccinate? So you, 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 there are still a number of questions that one needs to answer to, uh, for which uh, I think uh, we need um, to, to continue with uh, the research that have uh, started this, uh, in the DRC at least in 2017, and probably in other countries, what Brad would know, um, so that uh, you know uh, in the next uh, few years rather, uh, one could accumulate, um, you know, um, some good data on, um, uh, you know, the um, immunological responses that one can get uh, for, with this vaccine, the length of protection that one can get, uh, and, and many more uh, information before getting to, um, you know, a clear answer in terms of vaccination strategy. I will st stop by saying that uh, let's not forget that uh, vaccines are a complement to public health measures. Um, it's by it's themselves, you know, we're not solving all the issues, but but they are important, obviously. But clearly, uh, Brett and uh, others can uh, can add to what I said. And with that, I would also ask your indulgence because I I need to go to another meeting. Thank you. Any of the panelists who thank you, uh, Jean Marie. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll add just a few comments. I think Jean Marie has really hit the nail on the head here, though. Um, in these endemic areas where the zoonotic transmission continues to occur, um, the prevention messaging is very difficult, as I kind of described. Uh, I think the vaccine use. Um, now that we have growing evidence of the effectiveness of the, this vaccine to prevent mpox, I think that should spur more discussions about how can we use it. Uh, most beneficially in these areas where the disease remains endemic. I think in some of the epidemiologic studies we've done, we've identified some populations that are at higher risk for mpox disease. Uh, for example, healthcare workers are, are frequently um, infected, um, but other populations are, are just routinely um, exposed to uh, the animals that we presume are vectors and reservoirs of the virus. So um, making a recommendation to vaccinate um, hunters, for example, uh, it, it's difficult to do without, uh, I think, the additional epidemiologic data to identify who would most benefit from the vaccines. But I think those are the next steps to really identify those individuals. Thank you, Brett. Before leaving, I want to pose a last question to the panel and um, with a relatively short answer. So we now have another lesson with the monkeypox. What are the challenges for one health approach um, with the lessons we learn from, mon from monkeypox and also for application to other human zoonotic diseases? Who wants to start? So this is right. I, I can start with a few comments. I think, you know, we've already discussed the unfortunate siloing that often occurs between animal health and human health and environmental health and um, other sectors. I, I think, you know, anything we can do to kind of break down those um, communication barriers would be beneficial. Um, I, I think, um, highlighting the burden of these diseases is uh, really critical as well, kind of going back to some of the previous discussions about 
Um, how can we draw more attention? I think surveillance is really critical. If we can't show that you know, these diseases are a problem, then it's going to be hard to uh, make these arguments that uh, investments needed to be made. Um, if that can be accomplished, if we can demonstrate um, the, the need for attention to this area, I think some of the economic um, arguments uh, are quite persuasive uh, oftentimes with um, uh, uh, leadership um, and, and stakeholders. So additional analyses looking at uh, cost benefit, I think um, can be can be pretty persuasive uh, arguments um, uh, to increase investments in these areas. So there's just a few thoughts. Thank you very much, Brad. Uh, Yoshi. Uh, yeah, so I, I, mean, I can give a couple of ideas too. I think uh, Brett just mentioned, and, and I completely agree with that. And I think uh, one of the challenge, one challenge in terms of uh, uh, the surveillance or um, in in wildlife and primarily is, is definitely funding and resources because could be very resource intensive. Um, I think one thing that could help is uh, development of, of re uh, better diagnostics or better methods to, to like, do surveillance for multi-pathogens and, and, uh, and make the most of, of any type of strategy that could be, which is another thing that needs to be thought about too, a strategy of how are we going to survey Many different pathogens with many different types of cycles of uh, transmission, which uh, uh, may or may not overlap, and then um, try to to come to something uh, one or two or three strategies that could uh, help uh, understand that transmission and and, and function as early system, um, early early detection systems in in, the, in these multiple countries and areas that are are, are needed. Uh, yeah, in, uh, in involving or um, incorporating uh, research uh, or, or what is being done in the research into whatever, uh, into our like, it's existing or new uh, surveillance systems would be, would be key for that. Thank you. So we are at the end of this interesting webinar. Again, many thanks to uh, our two presenters. Uh, Brett and Yoshi for your excellent overview, a very comprehensive overview showing the human side, the animal side, the interactions. Um, I personally would say we need much, much more than that. And now I hand over to Kamel. So thank you very much, Joris, uh, for uh, co-chairing this uh, webinar. Thanks, uh, Yoshi. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, uh, thanks, Oko, for uh, your participation and. Uh, also those very interesting uh, presentations. So just to remind to the participants that uh, we will share the, the recording of this webinar and also the presentation from uh, the two speakers and um, also to encourage you to have a look at them because they have some very interesting links and very interesting annexes uh, that can complete the discussion of today. So thanks a lot to everybody and have a, a good evening, a good day and uh, good night. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you, everybody.